Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from Matthew 18. We are getting into, I don't know, kind of a strange collection of uh, sayings of our Lord. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Um, I, I'm kind of wrestling to, to try to find some thread uniting all of these things. So we'll go through them together. We'll see if anything pops out to me. Maybe something will pop out to you. But Jesus is going to be answering a question about who's the greatest and then kind of going on from there to some other things. So at at, um, at worst, we have a bunch of sayings of our Lord, a bunch of uh, answers to this question, and maybe we'll find uh, the thing that pulls it all together. Who knows? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read Matthew 18, 1 through 20. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains? and go in search of the one that went astray. And when he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. We've got kind of this, I don't know, just collection of things Jesus is saying, which is not a bad thing. I mean, I have this, uh, I'm making it sound like it's kind of bad, and it's really not. These are all good things for our Lord to be telling us. Where I'm, again, kind of wrestling with is I'm struggling to see and maybe there isn't. Maybe there isn't. I'm struggling to see what unites these things. Because we've got um, the disciples ask this question, who's the greatest? And then Jesus just talks. It's him talking, him talking, him talking, him talking. Then in verse 21, we have a new question. So it, it seems like this, our whole reading today, is Jesus' answer to who is the greatest. But it doesn't exactly seem to me, I don't know, like it's all his answers. So I don't know. This is one of those where, uh, yeah, where we'll, we'll walk through the text and kind of say what it is and maybe something will become more or less apparent. But starting off with the question, and, and this question launches Jesus into all of these different things. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, by our um, world standards, great, greatness is, is kind of an acquired thing. Greatness can be something you do. You do this really magnificent thing. Um, you make you make you make something. You make a movie. You make a work of art. You make a house. You make um, a family, right? It's it's actions that cause actions that cause people to see you as great. Hmm. I guess is the way to put it. Or maybe, well, maybe less so. Maybe you inherit greatness. Like if your parents were really great and and the next generation, this doesn't always happen, but the next generation maybe still has some of those characteristics and kind of keeps up the family name, still has that greatness. But again, they're doing things to make themselves great. And in contrast to this, Jesus puts a child in the midst of them and says whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so it's not a matter of um, doing things and like accumulating whatever we would say greatness is, but it's a matter of approaching God in humility and, and as a child looking to him, that is greatness in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus is kind of going on Right, um, still talking about children, right? Talks about children. Uh, I thought it was in here somewhere. Maybe not. Here we go. Despise one of these little ones. So he still kind of talks about children. Uh, one of these little ones should perish. He's, he's kind of talking about that through and through. And perhaps, perhaps uh, by extension, I'm, I'm really wrestling to come up with the thing in common. It's, it bothers me. Um, how we, maybe Jesus is, is sharing with us how we deal with one another, right? How we interact with one another. Because he talks about receiving a child receives me. Um, talks about causing them to sin. And how it would be better to be drowned, right? It would be better for you to drown and die than to cause one of these little ones to sin. So th this, is, this is a serious thing. This is not um, some, some light and easy thing that Jesus says, but how we interact with other Christians, and especially how we approach sharing our faith with, with, with the children, with, with the new generation of believers, is a very serious and important thing. And so we need to show them, by good example, first receiving them as uh, fellow believers, and then showing them good examples. Examples of things to avoid on the one hand, and examples of things to do on the other. And that we be very careful to continually set those good examples for the sake of our children. All right, next one. Temptations to sin. One of the kind of interesting things, it is necessary that temptations come. And Jesus doesn't really say why. why. Why is it the case that it is necessary that temptations come? That's an interesting... I'm, I'm not disputing with him. I'm interested to know why that is the case. I mean, I understand uh, the devil exists and there's evil in the world. Are, are those perpetuating temptations? I suppose so. I suppose they do, regardless of whether that's the reason or not. I mean, they do. Other people in their selfishness, cause, um, present temptations to people. The devil, in his fallenness, presents temptations to us. So, temptations do come. But again, the word to us is to be careful. Be careful of the example that we set. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. So, in our uh, words and actions, we need to be careful of, of what we are of the example we're setting, right? That we are not urging people to give in to any sort of temptation. And Jesus follows that up with, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it off. Um, better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet 
to be thrown into hell. Now, I did a um, sermon on this, I don't know, six weeks ago, a month ago, something like that. And so I'll just refer you to that. If I remember, hold on, I'm going to pause it. All right, now I just have to remember that I wrote myself the reminder. Um, so hopefully in the description is a link to, I did a sermon on, on the cutting off and what that looks like today. Because I don't think that Jesus is advocating um, finding a bone saw or a meat cleaver, but there are still ways that our hands and our feet and our eyes cause us to sin. And we need to seriously consider tearing tearing those things out or cutting those things off is kind of where the sermon goes. So if you haven't seen it, take a look down in the description is a, a li hopefully is a link to it, assuming that I remembered everything. And, and the idea is, which do we want more? Like, do we want that thing that is causing us to sin that probably seems really cool and we like, we like, we like doing, not that we enjoy sinning. Um, I don't know, that's sort of an interesting thought. We, I mean, on some level, we do like it, that's why we do it, but that we should love God more is kind of Jesus' point here, that we want to follow God more than we want to give in to sin. And so we're willing to tear out and throw away the sinning thing so that we can enter life e even with only a part of um, ourselves than to be thrown into hell with our whole complete selves. So that, that's, that's kind of the tension in this passage. Do we love God more and enough to give up these things that we maybe like doing or do we want to do those things? All right. Lost sheep. And again, Jesus is coming back to at the beginning and at the end, talking about those little ones. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. We have an interesting passage here. A couple very, very interesting just like drops drops the phrase and off he goes. Doesn't really, doesn't really explain it. And that's okay. I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Now, um, I won't say, here, here's how I want to say it. This does not necessarily have to only mean uh, a guardian angel, right? So here's what I mean. I'll tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father. So it, it is possible, and I'm not discounting it, uh, it is possible that each and every single child in existence has a certain angel, uh, I'll say responsible for them. And, and I don't even know what those responsibilities necessarily entail. But it is possible that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. One child has one angel. And we, we could then say their guardian angel. But this could also mean um, their angels, like children, the whole group of children has, to just throw out a number, ten angels in charge of them. And so there's not necessarily that one-to-one -one correspondence where every child has a particular angel, but like their, their doctors, right? Um, if we talk about a group of people and their doctors or their bankers or their lawyers, we're not saying that every patient has, that one doctor has exactly one patient. No, we're saying that a bunch of patients have a few doctors. And, and, and this could mean, could mean, that the bunch of children has a few angels. In which case, uh, there's still, I don't know which part of the phrase I'm, I'm taking issue with, there's still guardians, but, but there's not necessarily that personal guardian angel. Because we're not really promised that in God's word. That's one of those things that we've told ourselves often enough that we sort of believe it, but it's not... It's not necessarily the case. And, and again, here's one of those things um, that you can disagree uh, with me about. right? You can disagree. I think either interpretation is reasonable. Where, what is the there? What does the there mean? 
Like, is there that one-to-one -one correspondence? It, you could interpret it that way. Or is it this group has certain angels uh, responsible for them with, without that one-to-one -one correspondence? Either way, either way, slight aside, um, they do have these angelic beings that are able to be in the Father's presence. And so we should not, well, Jesus' words, we should not despise them, right? I was just going to say that. We should not think less of them, that they are less important. And that's kind of Jesus' point here, right? Don't, don't despise these little ones. They are just as important as, as any Christian is. And then he makes this point. Their angels see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Like, they are important enough that they have these angels who are able to be in the presence of God. So, so they are quite important people. And then Jesus goes into this uh, parable, I guess, parable, right? About having a hundred sheep, losing one, and going after the one. And he ends the parable by saying, It is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So these children are important enough that if I should have a hundred and one of them goes astray, that I will go and look for that one and I will leave the majority to kind of fend for themselves for the time being while I go off and find this one. My love for them is so great. They are so valuable to me that I will go and look for that one. And then Jesus ends us with how we, how we forgive one another, how we reconcile with one another. And the very most important thing is this opening line. If your brother sins against you. If he doesn't, if your brother has just sinned in general, then this doesn't apply to that situation at all, right? We can't just we can't just bracket these words and then launch into the rest of this. So here here's what I mean. If you know someone has done something wrong, uh, you don't necessarily have to do any of this. In fact, I would argue that you shouldn't do any of this. If 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 the thing that you know they did was wrong doesn't concern you in the slightest, then don't let this concern you in the slightest. But if your brother sins against you, if someone has done something wrong against you personally, then what Jesus says here applies in that situation. Then here's how we here's how we deal with it, right? You talk to that person alone. Um, if they don't, if they do listen, that's great. Then things are good. If they don't, you take one or two others along with you. Then um, then you tell it to the church. Here we go. And then, finally, you let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, which, which is to say a not non-Christian, not a Christian any longer. And again, if your brother sins against you, being the very, very most important part setting, whether this applies or not. So I'll, I'll go off a little bit more. If, if you just know someone has done something wrong, um... This kind of comes back to in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talked about we have a log in our own eye and our brother has a speck in his eye. And we're always like, oh, brother, over there, you, you have this tiny speck. Let me help you by removing that speck. Meanwhile, we have this whole gigantic log in our eyes. We love to point out when someone else has done something wrong and, be, and, and, and maybe be very well-meaning about it, maybe be very sincere about it, be like friend. I want to help you, not even realizing that <laughs> if any of my kids were here, they could answer this question. Who do I need you to worry about? I need you to just worry about you. Like, you have enough problems just worrying about you and making sure you've got your uh, things going well, right? You don't have to worry about other people. You have plenty to do making sure that you are doing things well and in a God-pleasing way. So that's what I mean. If, if somebody out there 
has done something wrong, um, I'm just going to say that's okay. Like, don't concern yourself with that. You have to worry about you. You have enough going on in your life to just worry about you, and, and there will be someone else to worry about that person over there, which, which would be the person that they have sinned against, right? Should be now in this position to be able to go and say, friend, you did something against me, which caused, caused this hurt and this problem, and we need to find a solution. You don't have to deal with that. Um, if it occurred against you, then take our Lord's words. But if it's just something that you know somebody did out there, leave, leave it alone. Someone else, Jesus is telling someone else to take care of that. He's not telling you, you are not so important uh, to need to take care of this. Jesus has lots of other people who will be able to do this. So you need to worry about you. You need to worry about you, making sure that all your stuff is good, don't worry about the other people, right? Someone else will worry about them. There we go. Parenting lesson. All right. I think we're done with the text. How weird. I don't know. We didn't, we didn't find the common thread. Maybe there isn't. Maybe it just evaded me. But anyway, um, Jesus gives us these different ways of living with one another, dealing with each other, reconciling. When, when someone has sinned against us, we have this, this procedure, this order of things that we do. And then also being, being worried about ourselves and the example that we set to other Christians, but especially the example that we give to, to our children, collect, collectively our children, the next generation of Christians that we're showing them the importance that God's word ought to have in our lives and that our own choices and actions are, are giving a good, reliable witness to that. We have to be concerned with ourselves. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask you to continue to grant us uh, humility like a child, continue to give us a trust in you and to look to you to provide the things that we need. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me on this devotion. Um, I'll see you next time. So, God's peace be with you.